Well, we're here, Dave and Allie and Lily and I, to talk about Lawrence Ferlinghetti's beat poem, Baseball Canto. Um, Lily, it's funny when you listen to Ferlinghetti. It's shtick almost, isn't it? It's funny because um, of the their, just his tone in reading it, but there are also a lot of puns in the poem, so it's mm. funny for both reasons. So let's talk about the stickiness, and then we'll talk about the puns. Sure. Um, Allie, it's it's sticky. I use that, I use that word, you know, specifically. It's it's not like some of the other beat poets, beat poems that we discuss in Mod Po, which, um, well, I don't know. Does it fit with the other beat poems? In what way does it, and doesn't it? Uh, well, the first thing I notice in the in the recorded performance is just his voice um, and the exuberance of the delivery. Um, and it's delivered. You can hear the humor in, in the delivery. Um, and I think, I think some of that stickiness you're referring to is just the juxtaposition of um, this kind of Anglo-Saxon epic and, and what, how he sets it up with the, this somber, almost funeral scene. And then just the... Um, kind of quotidian but boisterousness of uh, of baseball. So on one hand, you have the great tradition, the canon and the epic, which is associated with whiteness, really, and majoritarian rule and and government corporate hijinks and cahoots on one hand, and then you get this sort of um, you get this sticky. Mund- quotidian, as you call it, lefty, funny, kind of entertainment. Entertainment, Dave. Can you do anything with that dichotomy? We're still we're still on the topic of the way it sounds. I think something interesting about the stickiness is how it, it just comes off as a lot more obvious. Uh, it's probably a good thing Anna's not here because I don't think this poem requires quite as much work for as the she reader. Would like, yeah, um, yeah. It is it is easy. I mean, I I'm not a huge fan of this poem um in fact lily you can you can you can come all the way out of your anti-beat closet there's <laughs> you know there are some some aspects of kerouac you find just obvious and dull this this falls into that category doesn't it well i think if kerouac took himself a little less seriously the way that ferlinghetti does in this poem maybe so you like I that <laughs> part of it yeah um, um, but it don't stop nobody this time in their revolution around the loaded white bases yeah. in this last of the great Anglo-Saxon epics in the territory libre of baseball. You know, <laughs> that wasn't a great imitation, but it's what? What's going on there? Well, just to focus on f- focusing on baseball. I mean, he's talking about Anglo-Saxon as as trying to cue us, even though it's very obvious he's making a play on the canto um he's sort of equating the canto as in the sort of poem that Ezra Pound would write with a game of baseball. And it's like, he's written a canto about baseball. Almost like a parlor game he's playing. Yeah. um, I dare, dare me to write a poem about baseball, about the San Francisco giants that makes almost like a one-to-one analogous reference to Pound in the mm -hmm. Anglo-Saxon tradition. Um, But I mean, the, the beat aspect of it, of, I, what you were calling my criticism of the beats. It's like Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, but also, and white, but also incredibly masculine and male. Like there's no question of a female entity or um, I don't even think any of the, there's no female character in the play. Like it's all very masculine. So you're saying that Ferlinghetti does a good job of criticizing the white Anglo-Saxon canon, but... He doesn't open things up very far, actually, because it's all about the Chicano bleachers going loco. A bunch of beer drinking guys saying, yeah. sweet Tito, sock it to him, sweet Tito. He's still picking a part of culture that's inherently masculine. Okay. Well, let's, let's, um, well, let's stay on this topic of the performance. This, the reason that I did include this in Mod Po is that it is, it is really only performative it isn't that interesting on the page it's wonderful actually the first time you hear it you know as a performance so let's talk about performativity and the beats you know what's dave uh, the thing i find interesting about this it, it's not just that it's so performative but because it's a lot more obvious uh it requires a lot less work on the part of the reader it makes the poet himself figure more into the poem than others I, 
I read this and I know that it's clearly Ferlin Getty's opinions, Ferlin Getty's speaking. And it just makes me think about how when I'm called upon to do the work, the meeting is sort of a, a joint discussion. It's not just the poet, it's, it's me too. So let's talk about um, baseball and this analogy. There's lots of puns, I think. Did you say puns, Lily? I did, yeah. yeah let's, let's go around the horn and just make a list of some of the puns. Oh, go around the horn. <laughs> uh, let's do a triple play. Um, Who wants to go first? Pun. First pun. First double meaning. Double entendre. Um, as the gringo dollar beats out the pound. Okay, mm. so pound is a pun on... Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound, but also... The British Pound. The, the British Anglo, Pound. The Anglo Pound. The Anglo Pound, right. Okay. There's one, and a roar goes up as he clouts the first one into the sun. Because you have clout actually meaning a, a physical a physical hit or influence. It can be a political oh, wow. influence. Wow, you found one I hadn't, hadn't even thought of. It. <laughs> mm-hmm. What about, and Sweet Tito beats it out like he's beating out usury, not to mention fascism and anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. What's that a reference to? I'm um, guessing Pound's fascism and mm-hmm. anti-Semitism. Pound wrote the Usura Cantos in which he complained about Jewish usury. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is making, which is allegedly making money from money, mm-hmm. um, and of course, Ferlinghetti is joking that well, this guy Pound was a fascist and an anti-Semite, and Tito Fuentes, who's invade part of the invasion of Latin American players of non-white players in baseball, has to run like hell. Who, Who's um who's running away from the United Fruit Company? Is that Tito? Mm-hmm. Dave, the United Fruit Company, how does that get into a, a poem about the San Francisco Giants? Well, to the extent it's it's not a poem about the San Francisco di- Giants. I mean, the <laughs> United Fruit Company represents, uh, I guess, neocolonialism, capitalism to the extreme and and the collusion of, of governments in that. So it, it's it's sort of a, uh, a standard uh standard representation of what the left likes to criticize as colonialist imperialization. So the United Fruit Company was in fact a fruit company of Mm. Americans that uh, uh, basically extracted natural resources from Central America and I guess South America too. And it was backed up by the military, the United States government. So it was like a a militarily supported monopoly, um, a real, a real, um, you know, celebrated cause on the left through the 20th century. And here we have Tito Fuentes escaping, running away from Lily's rolling her eyes. <laughs> uh, only because it's like, it's, it's stereotyping him. You know, he didn't, Tito Fuentes didn't personally run away from the United Fruit Company to baseball to become a baseball star. That's true. Know? Although it's possible to think about some, the emergence of Latin American players, in some cases, as a kind of political asylum, uh, certainly from the repressive regimes of Central America and then more recently from Cuba. It's true, but it's still kind of unfairly using him as a symbol of that left cause. He's just a guy playing baseball. What about Willie Mays? So it looks like the uh, Irish cops who are, sorry, the white umpires who are like Irish cops in their little black suits and little black caps pressed over their hearts, standing straight and still, like at some funeral of a Blarney bartender. They're all facing east as if expecting some great white hope or the founding fathers. Who, who, what, what, what's the great white hope there? What, what are they hoping for, according to Ferlinghetti? Yes, boxer. Well, the great mm-hmm. white hope would be the idea that a white mm-hmm. boxer could defeat mm-hmm. African-American boxers who began taking over um, as newly emergent populations tend to do in boxing and other sports like that. So, but more generally, the idea was we're hoping some white guy comes and, and is the home run hitter uh, or the founding fathers. But who appears instead? Guy from Alabama named Willie Mays. The great New York giant, later San Francisco giant, Willie Mays. So Ferlinghetti is figuring Mays as interrupting the advance or the 
maintenance of white baseball. And I think he's also, he's like intentionally, by calling the umpires Irish cops, he's like intentionally talking about the racial discomfort of white cops in black neighborhoods or white cops in Latino neighborhoods and applying that onto baseball and like trying to get us to see the similarity. It's really more of a New York poem, a Brooklyn poem, Mm -hmm. than it is a San Francisco poem. And he's, he's a San Francisco poet and he's being... Uh, a fan of the San Francisco Giants, but Brooklyn kind of sneaks in. For one thing, Willie Mays, mm-hmm. when he abrupted onto the scene as a great star, uh, as you know, uh, you know, not much, not lo- long after uh, Jackie Robinson in the same league in the same town, um, you know, this was really a New York story. And I, and New York sneaks back in. Where does it sneak back in? You mean the Brooklyn beer drinkers? Yeah, it's San Francisco. They're at Candlestick Park, but the Brooklyn beer drinkers seem to be screaming. So, Allie, what do you make of this? Well, this might be a stretch, but you could also potentially read it as going from, as over the course of the poem, migrating from the East Coast to the West Coast Mm -hmm. in terms of some of the ethnic demographics and just some of the references. So even though kind of towards the middle, those Brooklyn beer drinkers um, kind of work their way back in, you have, I mean, uh, New York, historically, big Irish town. Um, and as you go through the rest of the poem, you get more into um, Latino politics and things that are more relevant, um, or maybe maybe not more relevant, but more central on the West Coast. Yeah, I think if you anatomize this poem, it you can pick apart its little, little socioeconomic um, uh, scenarios of a tr- transition in life, in American life in the 50s and early 60s. So you get some of that. Um, you know, baseball can be seen without irony as a territorial libre. Can, should, can we at least just say that, talk about that for a minute to give it its credit? Well, there are a couple of ways in which that's true. One we've been talking about, Dave. Well, in in sports, you're judged on your performance, and especially in baseball, you're judged on the basis of statistics by a lot of people. So you know, that that becomes after a great the color equalizer line, after the color line. Gets after broken, yeah, yeah, after everybody's brought into the game, it's it's based on on how well you do. So it puts all that aside, but you have to get in there first. And territorial libre, not the not the uh, uh, liberated territory, but the Spanish. Why this? Why the use of the Spanish? Kind of obvious, but. Um, going back to the Chicano and Latino imagery from earlier in the poem, talking about the um, baseball as a f- sort of a frontier of what he hopes is a revolution in race politics and um, better racial understanding between people of different races. And you get a desperation in the official institutional aspects of the game so that as Juan Marichal who was a pitcher and wouldn't likely hit a home run, but there you go. Juan Marichal, the great pitcher, Tito Fuentes, a light-hitting uh, second baseman or third baseman, uh, and Willie Mays, a legitimate star. All these uh, non-white players emerging, some nut, presumably one of the Irish umpires, mm-hmm. presses the panic button. And what, what comes out of that? The pre-recorded national anthem. So, the you know, kind of a restoration of of uh you know americanness but clearly in the humor of this situation that's not going to stop nobody okay there's one more thing about about baseball as a territorial libre any any i have something specific in mind but i i want to pause for a second to see if anybody else thinks of this Allie, what were you going to say i was just thinking of the nature of rounding bases and taking home and um, I mean, that right there, the word home is a pretty loaded base. <laughs> you ah, want to go all the yes. way with the... Well, he's clearly, I mean, Ferlinghetti's pl- clearly aware of all those puns that you get. So, if you, you know, you get Ken Burns doing, you know, 50 hours of talking heads about baseball. About 25 hours are going to be people talking about how great it is to come home and what a perfect American mm-hmm. sport it is. What I had in mind is simply this, that baseball until it became too expensive for a lot of people to go to the games until very recently until 10 years ago 
Baseball is one of two places where the classes can mix and the races after a while. Um, baseball stadiums. Uh, the other would be stoops on the summer, summer nights um, and the corners and the churches. Mm. But uh, baseball, was a, a baseball stadium was where, um, where you could get the grungy populace and that they could, they could cheer on their underclass or minority heroes. And uh, there is something unironically to be said about this. Well, so what about Pound? I guess we need to go back to the problem of modernism because Pound, it, he might, Lily, just be standing in for his anti-Semitism. Uh, but I think it's possible to read Ferlinghetti as saying something about what beat poetry should do in relation to certain assumptions made by the modernists. Is it, should we go with that? Well, he's talking about, he, he's talking about revolution, um, but he's talking about revolution in the in the another pun, in a by pun the way. right a pun i was going to say a pun that has to do with the way baseball is played which is a very slow moving um game in terms of so like the revolutions <laughs> don't happen very quickly in baseball right um and i think he's probably reacting to you know revolutionary movements that had come before like modernism was a revolution but it included fascism and anti-semitism and it didn't include people who looked like tito fuentes and so and shored up the anglo-saxon tradition right so does anybody want to go any further with this do you think this is is it just stick or is it a critique of the inheritance pro problematic problematic inheritances from modernism do you think by we get the time we get to the beats alley i think it's notable that you know, the umps who are kind of the um, the referee figures in um, within, within baseball. Uh, presumably it's one of it's one of the umps who who tries to flick back on the national anthem, but that can't overcome all the ambient noise and all the ambient. The only uh, I don't think we get any any mentions of um, of audience or or crowd that isn't um, a kind of new, in a new minority position. Um, and so I think that's really, I think that's a statement about kind of just the ambient noise of beat too. Um, and which gets back to the performance element, just this kind of like raucous, um, you know, like let's, let's read this and drink some beers and laugh. And I kind of am taken back to, um, to Ginsburg's one of her one of his first performances of Howell, I think it was. I um, think the one or, the drunken performance yeah. is America. Yeah, America. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the point you're making. Um, that really is great because um, I think that Ferlinghetti and Ginsburg, maybe a little less so Kerouac, Ferlinghetti and Ginsburg were thought thought of their aesthetic as something that people that the people that the grungy populace not only could identify with, but felt that it might bespeak their positions. S to some degree, this is a fantasy, but at least this is where they lined up. And there is the distinction between someone like Pound, who is clearly looking back to, though a revolutionary writer in some ways, looking back to the tradition, which would have excluded the grungy populace. Um, to be specific, um, the Anglo-Saxon tradition in the first canto, does anybody... Uh, know what that is because the cantos are not typically anglo-saxon ezra pounds you know 120 some cantos am i the guy who does the footnote on this so the first canto is actually the odyssey a retelling of the story of the odyssey which is not anglo-saxon not even close right okay because that's greek but it makes use of a very famous anglo-saxon translation of this particular story in the Odyssey. This is a poem that I, as you know, because you've heard me do this, um, that I've memorized a little bit of. And then went down to the ship, set keel to breakers, forth on the godly sea, and we set up mast and sail on that swart ship, and etc. So you get all those monosyllables, and that is a way in which Pound brilliantly for the modern period, reproduces the sounds 
of Anglo-Saxon. And the irony here, I mean, boy, Ferlinghetti's politics is all mis- mixed up. Because the irony there is that what, Can- what Pound was doing was he was featuring not the hoity-toity, fancy, Latinate descendants of the Odyssey, but actually featuring the grungy populace of, of northern England, the monosyllabic, mm-hmm. grunting Celtic. Right. So this really is all confused. Uh, let's, uh, let's get final words. We'll go around and get final words. We, and I guess, have we, have we enjoyed the humor of this en- enough? Maybe we've been a little too serious about this. It is hilarious. I mean, I think audiences really kind of stand up and cheer when they hear this. Allie, final word? Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the things, one of the first things that was said was for a lot of people, it's most enjoyable the first time. And I think that this might be an example of, of a poem that we shouldn't probably talk about. Yeah, too much. like once you start. Yeah, I think sports in general is something. Well, actually, I don't know how true this is. There are a lot of examples that go against this, but um, it's not something that I think the majority of sports watchers really like go into and analyze. They just want they're in it for the emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in it for. Uh, the winning and the losing and the running And maybe a certain kind of beat performance poetry should be put in that category too, yeah. like a entertainment. Exactly. Okay, cool. I like that. Dave, last thoughts? Just because it's more obvious, it doesn't require as much work, I, I don't think makes it less enjoyable. It makes it just different. And I, I think it, it's, it's harder to compare uh, poems like this that have their effectiveness based on, you know, more creative imagery from the poet, uh, and funny, you know, funniness and and puns. I mean, that, that's where the strength of this poem comes from. And it's not uh, trying to create a dialogue as much with the reader. And there's something to be said about that too. I find this enjoyable. Lily. I think something I take from this poem, even more than the race politics and the, um, left versus right movements that Fred Getty's pointing out is just the thought of baseball, as an aesthetic model for beat poetry, which sounds kind of weird as I'm saying it. <laughs> um, but when, like Ali was saying before, when you go to a baseball game, it's not really exciting and it's not finely crafted and wrought every second of it. There's some things that are exciting and some things that are really boring and they're all mixed together and you can go from zero to 60 in terms of emotion and activity, like just really quickly and flat. And so, but when you go to, when you make the choice to go to a baseball game, you you come with your popcorn and your book in his case he's jokingly he's saying it's Ezra Pound yeah. but you Sitting would you in would the sun eating popcorn <laughs> which is a funny image but if you went to a baseball game you would bring something else and there's this like baseline level of distraction and mm-hmm. the mundane mixed with the highly emotional and so everyday. it is kind of interactive and mm-hmm. um, there's multitasking and of course that happens at a a beat poetry reading yeah. yeah yeah that's that's so interesting um yeah, and of course, uh, I guess my final word is simply that, uh, you know, p- perhaps the first poet ever of any poet to write about baseball was Walt Whitman. He was one of the first commentators in print in a Brooklyn newspaper to comment on baseball. And, and the Beats owe so much to Whit- the Whitmanian sense of the grungy populace. So maybe this is, maybe it, in the end, this is a great thing to have in Mod Poe.